Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the committee's 23rd meeting in 2019. Could I ask everyone please to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? The first agenda item is a declaration of interest, and I'd like, before we go into that, is formally welcome Emma Harper and Angus MacDonald to the committee. And before I ask them to declare their interest, I'd like to place on record uh, my thanks, and I believe the committee's thanks, to John Mason and Gail Ross, who have worked extremely hard on the committee uh, since uh, this session of the Parliament started. I also would like to, to comment that Gail Ross was particularly helpful to me as a deputy convener, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank for the work that she put into that. Now, Emma and Angus, I'd like you perhaps to consider a declaration of interest. Emma, would you like to go first, please? Sure. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am very pleased to be joining the Rural uh, Economy Committee, and I look forward to contributing to the committee's work. I do not have any financial interest to declare. However, I am taking forward a member's bill entitled Livestock. Uh, it's a livestock worrying members bill to prevent uh, uh, attacks by out of control dogs. So that might become part of the committee's work programme. Thank you. Um, Angus. Okay, thank you. Um, convener, it's good to be back, having served on the, the former RACI committee uh, for a number of years in the previous session of Parliament. Um, with regard to my declaration of interest, I own a non domestic property in the Coral Nanyelan Shear Council area. Uh, which is situated on an estate which is likely to be the subject of a hostile buyout attempt by the local community in the near future. Thank you. Uh, and I... Uh, other, other than that, I have nothing to declare. <laughs> 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 OK. Uh, therefore, we'll move straight on to agenda item two. And the committee's task is, therefore, to choose a deputy convener to replace Gail Ross, who held that post. Now, the Parliament's agreed that only members of the Scottish National Party are eligible for nomination as deputy convener of this committee. Uh, and I would invite a member of that party to nominate one of their number for that post. Uh, Stuart. Um, it's my very great pleasure to uh, nominate my esteemed uh, colleague, and all my colleagues are esteemed, uh, Maureen Watt, to the post of Deputy Convener. Uh, thank you very much, Stuart, for that. Can I just ask whether the committee, with, whether they agree with the nomination of the Deputy Convener? We do agree. Great. Congratulations, uh, Maureen, uh, as your appointment to Deputy Convener. Now, are you going to yes. move post? <laughs> Perfect. A, sm a small pause while we shuffle the seats. <laughs> Welcome, Emma, and goodbye. <laughs> Okay, uh, we can now uh, move on to agenda item three, which is rail service in Scotland. And today we'll take evidence from ScotRail on the rail performance issues, its recent responses to a remedial order on passenger satisfaction and an update on the progress in relation to a previous remedial order in relation to a breach of performance uh, levels. I'd like to welcome the panel, Alex Hines, the Managing Director of Scotland so Railway, Saeed Gofran, the Engineering Director, Scott Rail, and Liam Sumter, the Route Director, Network Rail Scotland. Alex, would you like to give an opening statement of no more than three minutes? Alex. Of course. Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to appear before the committee. Uh, as we sit here today, Scotland's Railway is in a much healthier position compared to my previous appearance in March. Of course, it hasn't all been plain sailing. We've faced some difficult days. But overall, the direction is positive for both track and train. The completion of the driver and conductor training and the successful introduction of the new timetable in May continues to improve our reliability and provide more seats in key areas that were affected earlier this year, uh, particularly Fife and the Borders. We now have 64 of our 70 fantastic brand new Hitachi trains in service and we're much better prepared for extreme weather than ever before. Our investment to cope with hot weather paid off during the summer. 
Last summer, we saw more than 1,000 trains miss their punctuality target due to hot weather, and using the same measure this year, that dropped to just 200. However, the recent flooding, where a month's worth of rainfall fell in just three hours, caused significant disruption in the central belt and on the West Highland Line. And I'm really proud of the way all our staff across Scotland's railway pulled together for their dedication and commitment working round the clock to keep our customers moving and get the railway back open again. Our improved performance has also been reflected in the late latest National Rail Passenger Survey, which measured 85% overall customer satisfaction with ScotRail. It's all a step in the right direction, but we know that there is more to do. The £4 million investment Abellio is making through the Passenger Satisfaction Remedial Plan will build on the progress we have made in recent months, and combined with Abellio's £18 million investment in the Train Service Performance Remedial Plan, we are confident that we are beginning to deliver the service our customers expect and deserve. Through this plan, we have launched a new WhatsApp service for our customers, making it even easier to get in touch with us. And customers should also experience a comfortable and clean journey, and that's why we'll undertake more frequent deep cleans to provide the high level of cleanliness our customers expect. And we will invest in new and improved devices for our frontline people to improve access to live disruption information so we can keep our customers better informed when things go wrong. We know challenges remain. Despite an otherwise really strong performance during the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, we let our customers and our colleagues down on the final weekend, and we will, of course, be sharing what we will do to minimise the risk of that happening again. But overall, we are delivering more for our customers. Compared to the start of the ScotRail franchise, under a bellow, we now deliver 115,000 more seats, 200 more services every day. We employ 500 more staff, and all for less subsidy. That's a strong record on which to build. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Before we go into the questions, um, when I introduce you, I introduced you as Managing Director of Scotland's Railway, which is a change of title to, to, to what I've introduced. Could you just explain that briefly? And, and that's not going to be a complete rebranding everywhere we go, is it? It's not, no. So, uh, on the 24th of June, uh, Network Rail reorganised uh, itself to provide uh, a much greater level of devolution to each of the five regions of which one is Scotland. And, of course, uh, I wear two hats. I'm the Managing Director of ScotRail. I'm also the Managing Director of Network Rail in Scotland. And so we felt that Managing Director of Scotland's Railway better reflected uh, my new responsibilities. So, uh, previously, I wasn't responsible for capital capital delivery. I wasn't responsible for the long-term planning of Scotland's railway, and now I am, and I think this is a great opportunity for us to uh, be even better pulling track and train together to do a better job for the people of Scotland. So ScotRail Alliance, is th this is the replacement, is it? Uh, the ScotRail Alliance still exists. Uh, it's the partnership between the two organisations. It's just my job title which has changed. Mm. OK. Um, well. We'll see with the questions then. Angus is going to lead off with the first question. Angus. Okay, thanks. Um, convener, good morning, uh, Mr. Hines. Um, if I could uh, look at the. Uh, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the, uh, the, the challenges the wet weather uh, brought this summer. So uh, if we could look at the issues relating in particular to the, the Winchborough Tunnel in August. Um, now, we know that uh, it was flooded twice uh, during August, seriously disrupting services between Edinburgh and Glasgow. So I'd be keen to know how uh, this could happen, given the tunnel, uh, uh, including drainage, was significantly upgraded in 2015. Could of course. Um, Liam, would you like to lead on this item? Of course. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, Winchborough Tunnel, as you know, as, as you stated, um, was was redesigned as part of the Edinburgh to Glasgow improvement project four years ago, and as part of that, the project team installed brand new drainage there, which was an uh, improvement on the previous drainage, and installed pumps that, um, in the event that there was any flooding in the tunnel, would would remove the water quickly. Um, as Alex mentioned in his opening remarks, we had extremely heavy rainfall in a very short period of time in that location. 
um, which under no normal circumstances we would expect the infrastructure to be able to, to cope with there, given, given its relative newness. However, a um, particular problem that occurred with that first big flood was that um, a development company nearby the railway hadn't maintained the ditches that protect the railway as well as they should have done. Um, and uh, as a result, water cascaded onto the network far quicker than the drainage could cope with and far quicker than the pumps could cope with. Um, when, when the railway floods, the rule book states that we can't run trains if water is above the level of the railhead at all, um, because that's principally because we don't know what's happening underneath the water level and whether the, um, the track is moving and remains stable for the passage of trains. When Winchborough Tunnel flooded, the water is actually two feet above the railhead, so clearly not safe, nowhere near safe enough to be able to consider running trains. Um, so we're working with local landlords and, and, and the development company concerned to make sure that we, um, we that they understand their responsibilities and we protect the rail railway from that ever happening again. And we're also going to review the capability of the drainage within that tunnel and everywhere in every tunnel across um, the Edinburgh to Glasgow route to, to make sure that that sort of disruption can't happen again. Okay, so the, the drains that caused the problem initially, have they now been cleared or is that still work to be done? The, the drains um, that, that caused the problem, so the ditches on the third party land have been cleared and the drains within the tunnel themselves have also been cleared as well. Um, and as I said, we're reviewing the capability of those drains to make sure, because there's so much development work going on in that part of the country, um, we don't want that, this to ever happen again, so we're reviewing to see whether we can improve the drains even further. We actually had some help during the course of that flooding um, from the, and the fire and rescue team, which was we're extremely grateful for, um, and they introduce some even more powerful pumps. So we're looking at whether we can um, we can install them on a permanent basis to provide an even greater level of resilience. Okay. Um, we, we also know that uh, ScotRail was only able to provide a limited bus replacement service uh, during the disruption uh, caused by the flooding at Winchborough. So can you explain why uh, this was, and, and what are you doing to ensure that full bus replacement services are made available during future periods of disruption? Um, so we have five uh, routes between Edinburgh and Glasgow now, all electrified, uh, and with the closure at Winchborough, uh, our primary objective was to keep customers moving by train. Uh, and as a daily commuter on Edinburgh Glasgow myself, uh, we were able to offer uh, customer journeys on the Airdrie Bathgate line. And we made the carriages on those services uh, even longer than they already are. And I'm pleased to report, having experienced it firsthand, that uh, those arrangements worked very well. Uh, where customers weren't able to take alternative train services, uh, we do provide uh, rail replacement services. Uh, sometimes immediately after an event has happened, we do struggle to procure those because uh, the vehicles are on alternative uh, uses. But our priority in this case was actually to give people an alternative rail journey rather than a bus journey. Okay. Um, now, we also know that uh, a non-electrified diversionary rail route uh, avoiding the Winchborough Tunnel via Dalmeny uh, wasn't used during this period of disruption. So can you explain why this route couldn't be used and, and whether there are any plans to electrify this in the future um, and any other diversionary routes that could be looked at, such as the Edinburgh South Suburban Line? And um, could you also uh, perhaps explain why um, the, 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 there was talk in the recent past of a new cord via the Dalmeny line, um, but that seems to have come off the table, uh, doesn't seem to be on the radar anymore. Uh, can you explain uh, why that is and if there's any possibility of that cord being looked at in the future? Mm -hmm. So we weren't able to use the diversionary diesel line in this case because electric trains can't use diesel routes and all our diesel trains are allocated to diesel routes. Um, so you highlight there a good opportunity for us to build in uh, future resilience in terms of the train service. So um, with my Network Rail hat on, uh, clearly uh, Network Rail will build the rail enhancements that Scottish Government uh, chooses to buy and uh, Transport Scotland have a rail enhancement budget of around £200 million to spend during uh, control period six. 
And uh, my network rail team are spending a lot of time advising and assisting the Scottish Government on allowing them to make the right choices for that money. The Scottish Government has recently published a number of priority projects for rail enhancements uh, on the Scottish Rail Network, and one of those uh, projects is called the Edinburgh Waverley Western Approaches Project. And what that's looking at is the capacity, the track, the signalling, the electrification of the railway uh, west of Waverley towards Haymarket, uh, out towards the bridge. Uh, because increasingly what we're finding is the rail infrastructure in that part of the world is constraining our operation. It's very difficult for us to add any further services onto that part of the network. And so our strategy is to make the existing services longer. But in the long term, you're absolutely right. We need to spend some serious money west of Waverley to give us a bigger and better railway both for higher performance, uh, better customer satisfaction, but also to give us more options when we lose some routes due to exceptional circumstances. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jamie, you wanted to come in briefly. Thank Green, you, Convener. Sorry. Just to, um, uh, and I, I'm just checking, I'm not encroaching on anyone else's area of discussion, but you're, you're talking about this, uh, this pot of money that exists within the Scottish Government that, that via, presumably via Transport Scotland is spent on uh, uh, infrastructure upgrades. Um, and you mentioned a, perhaps a process that they're going through in which they're advised by S ScotRail on where that money might best be spent. I assume there are more projects than there is cash available in terms of upgrade potentials. So who makes a decision and what's the process that's gone through to ensure that the money spent in the right parts of Scotland, uh, presumably by default letting other areas down that wouldn't be spent on in that control period? So the strategy and planning team within Network Rail undertake this work and the way the process works is between Transport Scotland and Network Rail we identify what's called a pipeline of potential projects and I think on the latest count there were 118 projects in that pipeline and you're absolutely right, uh, the amount of funding uh, is, uh, doesn't allow all those projects to happen. So what we do is we evaluate those projects uh, and we make sure that Scottish Government understand the costs and the time scale and the benefits of each of those projects. Uh, we then provide that information to Transport Scotland and they put that through their business case evaluation process. Mm -hmm. And uh, then ultimately it's for Transport Scotland to decide what rail enhancements are built. Uh, and then uh, having decided what they want to build, they then hand that project back to us and we go and build it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next question then is John Finney. John. Good morning, panel. Good morning, Mr Hines. Uh, Mr Hines, you may be aware I visited the site in the West Highland Line where there was the landslide and the embankment collapsed and congratulations to everyone for the hard work that went into bringing it about. Can you explain what mechanisms are in place to identify frailties on that line? Because it was perhaps good fortune that it was accessible as it was, um, and uh, how you build resilience into it. I, I certainly met one of your engineers there who deals with hydrology, and I understand it's scoped out. Can you explain a bit more about that, please? Yeah, of course. I mean, running a railway like Scotland's railway is quite a formidable task, which is why we employ lots of very clever engineers to understand the safety and the performance risks of operating railways in such a, uh, a challenging environment, which you saw yourself and, and I did too. So um, the first priority for us, of course, is safety. Uh, and clearly we spend a lot of time recording measurements of the track, but also uh, embankments, for example. Uh, and in a, this latest uh, control period, the five yearly funding period, we've got 22% extra money to spend on the operations, maintenance and renewal of the rail network in Scotland. And about a third of that is specifically focused on making the railway more resilient to the more extreme weather we are seeing. And so one of the things that we are pioneering here in Scotland is the uh, fitment of remote condition monitoring equipment. So we actually put probes into the embankment and they detect movement before it's actually visible to the human eye. Uh, we're using drone technology increasingly to undertake uh, inspections. 
and uh, we're also making more use of the network rail helicopter to give us the data we need to manage this network uh, uh, as well as we can. Um, so a huge amount of effort goes in behind the scenes to keep our railway open, safe and uh, more reliable and there'll be more of that work uh, happening in the coming years um, because we now have the budget to make our railway more resilient to the new weather we're seeing. Um, that railway was built in Victorian times when the weather was less challenging. I asked the, your staff at the site how it had been identified and I was told that it was indeed local knowledge that there was a, a rail worker there who yeah. knew the vulnerabilities who went out and inspected it. So yeah. there's still a, an important role for humans as well as all that technology. Absolutely, absolutely. And both in ScotRail and Network Rail, we are employing more and more people. Uh, the headcount on Scotland's railway is growing strongly um, because we are creating a bigger and better railway for Scotland. And of course, we need people to do that. And you're absolutely right. The actions of the local um, person there helped us avoid uh, a potential more serious uh, event because clearly our worst case scenario is that a train meets a landslip. It was touched in relation to the response to Mr Macdonald there, but the role that uh, adjoining properties adjoining the, the railway, that remains a challenge. In this instance, I understand the, the local landowner was particularly helpful. Indeed, the mm. local quarries were helpful. Everyone uh, yeah. pulled together. But what steps are you taking to engage across the length of mm. your network with uh, adjoining properties? Because so. The, the most important th thing is that we don't just survey our, the railway, we survey the land around the railway. Uh, and in many cases that land we don't own, and in some cases there are huge uh, stretches of um, hill above the railway. Um, we, you may have seen on the latest More 4 documentary, The World's Most Beautiful Railway, the remedial work we had to take place to protect the railway at Loch Eelt, um, following a landslip there. Actually, we were spending most of our money on someone else's land to protect the railway. So um, this issue is becoming a bigger part of our work uh, and the key to cracking this nut is to have better information which means we need to survey other people's land as well as our own. Okay, thank you. And, and when it comes to advising the travelling public about problems with the track, you mentioned WhatsApp. What other methods do you have in place? Because that's often a frustration. People can be frustrated enough on finding out there's a problem, but if they don't know there's a problem, that... Yeah. Um, well, we continue to invest heavily in improving customer information, so now every single station on Scotland's rail network, with the exception of Dunrobing Castle, has real-time customer information. We continue to invest both in technology at our Paisley and Dunfermline customer information and, customer and security centres. Uh, and as part of the uh, customer satisfaction remedial plan, we're putting more staff into those locations. So our ability to provide up-to-date, accurate, uh, reliable information to customers, particularly at weekend. Um, so there's a whole host of activities um, with the purpose of a providing a reliable railway and secondly managing things better when uh, there are delays okay thank you very much thank you okay there's a few uh, supplementaries i'd like to bring in maureen followed by stuart thank you convener um a number of us traveled to um sky uh, over the weekend uh, and the amount of water coming off the hills was spectacular but also uh, very worrying so how much remedial work do you think you'll need to do because of land shifting above the railway rather than just waiting for a landslip to occur that actually take away some of the the earth before it causes a landslip uh well a, a lot as in hundreds of millions of pounds will be invested over the next five years on that issue and clearly the way we attack uh, the problem is to use risk assessment so what are the chances of uh, these events happening? But also, secondly, what's the potential consequence 
of that happening. Uh, so, for example, uh, a train hitting a landslip on a high-speed line has a higher consequence than on a low-speed line, for example. And we use those decision criteria to decide where we uh, best spend the money to make sure we provide safety and performance and resilience. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, you've got a... It was just a wee clarification. Uh, can... Uh we have a confirmation that Dunrobin Castle is actually a station is privately owned. That is correct, and I believe that's the reason why it doesn't have the customer information system. But that's fine. Nevertheless, I still think it should have a customer information yes, system. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, there's an interesting point. Uh, the, Rich, Richard Lyle, yours is the next question. Yes, good morning, Mr. Haynes and panel. Um, Saturday, 24th of August. The Twitter traffic increased substantially, with some interesting posts and videos read the problems at Waverley and Haymarket. So can you explain the reasons behind the breakdown in services exp experienced by passengers at Waverley and Haymarket in the evening of Saturday, 24th of August, given the likelihood of high passenger, the high, very high passenger numbers had been known for months due to the Edinburgh Festival and the Rugby International at Murrayfield. So uh, clearly the Edinburgh Festival presents us with challenges every year and uh, planning for that event is a huge focus for my team and I in the run up to the event and this year we delivered our biggest ever Edinburgh Festival plan and that was enabled because the ScotRail rolling stock fleet is the biggest it's ever been. We now have uh, 1,000 carriages in our fleet. And so throughout the Edinburgh Festival, we were able to provide over 20% more carriages this year compared to last. Uh, clearly, on the day in question, that wasn't sufficient. Um, if you recall, it was the final weekend of the festival, which is the busiest. Uh, there was also a rugby event at Murrayfield, uh, and uh, the weather was rather good that day. So uh, we took many people into Edinburgh, and clearly the numbers of people who wanted to travel back at the same time um, created some pressure on the system. We had three circumstances where customers actually pulled the passenger alarm, which meant that trains were brought to a stand. Uh, and clearly, of an event uh, which caused that much customer pain, uh, we've done what we call an incident learning review. And once we've um, finalised that review, I will be publishing the learnings of that. The learnings won't just affect the railway, the learnings will also affect major event management in the city of Edinburgh because um, these events are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I'm not sure it is wise for us to host the rugby at Murrayfield at the same time as the busiest uh, Edinburgh Festival weekend and that's a conversation I've already started to have with Scottish rugby. So it's clear to me we're going to have to manage this risk in a different way. Uh, I'm disappointed that happened on the Saturday night because the rest of the festival plan worked perfectly. You had scenes of people being pushed, squeezed, sardined into uh, trains. Surely with the technology you were going over, what you said a minute ago, <clears throat> you should know how many rail tickets you've sold. You should know what your capacity is. Your staff should either be holding people um, back, as I've seen in, in, in other uh, situations, the excellent uh, programme they had about Glasgow Central, where people were, were being advised where, where to go. But that aside, what, so that's the other points I want to make. But what action is Scott Rail Alliance taking to learn from significant disruption, improve planning for future major events which generate increased service demand? And can I add one slightly? <clears throat> Would you agree with me that also some of your delays are due to other operators who operate on your line? I was in Manchester and I saw at a particular station about six different carriers going by that station. Um, and, you know, that's, that's England. Um, how many operators in Scotland do you have to share the same lines with? Mm -hmm. So... The first point on major event planning, our objective is we get better at better at managing those major events. 
and our ability to cope with those major events uh, will ease in the future because the rolling stock fleet continues to grow so we're able to provide more capacity and more seats for our customers. Um, we operate a walk-up railway uh, and that presents some logistical challenges and so one of the things we need to think about is do we actually put quota controls in uh, on those very very busy days uh, is it wise to keep Haymarket and Waverley Station open at the same time for example these are all the things which we're thinking about because um, you know the Edinburgh Festival is only going to get bigger so we might need to adapt our operation accordingly in terms of uh, other operators, of course, um, Scotland's Railway uh, is not an island. Uh, there are uh, other train operating companies, uh, cross-border and freight. And uh, as I've previously advised the committee, um, every delay uh, on the network is either allocated to ScotRail or to Network Rail, the infrastructure manager, or another train operating company, Sleeper, Virgin West Coast, LNER, Transparent, etc. So the railway is a system and all those players play its part in the system. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And the next question is Jamie Green. Jamie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, so, uh, Mr Hines, uh, I'm going to move on the conversation to the remedial plans. Um, some of my colleagues will talk about the customer satisfaction plan, the second plan, but I'd like to focus on performance. Um, and in my questions, uh, again, other colleagues have questions about rolling stock and driver and conductor recruitment, so if you could perhaps leave those aside whilst I focus more on some of the other aspects of the remedial agreement. Um, the agreement, uh, you submitted a plan in uh, February of this year with 19 uh, specific points to address. I wonder if you could give me a, a general update on your pro uh, progress on whether you think you're meeting some of those 19 and which of those you think you're perhaps struggling with, if so? Of course. So, I mean, we have a dedicated project manager for the Train Service Performance Remedial Plan and we have a weekly meeting with Transport Scotland to go through our progress on the delivery of that plan. And I'm pleased to report that each of the actions in the remedial plan have either been delivered or on, are on track to be delivered in line with the plan. So there are no remedial plan activities which are at risk of not being delivered. Um, and as well as delivering the inputs of the remedial plan, of course, we need to deliver the outputs in terms of a more reliable service to our customers. And I'm also pleased to report that in terms of uh, the trajectory of uh, PPM recovery, we're also on track to deliver that. So both the inputs of the plan and the outputs of the plan are being delivered in line with the £18 million investment we're making. So let's look at some of the numbers. Where, where are we at in terms of our performance metrics at the moment? The uh, PPM is reported in two forms. Could you update the committee on the periodic measure and also the moving annual average figures and how perhaps they compare to this time last year? So the moving annual average is 87.5 currently. Uh, against the target of 92.5, so we're the wrong side of 90. And uh, the moving annual average has improved in recent months off its low point, which happened earlier in the year. So it's 87.5. When do you think you'll hit the 92.5? Uh, I previously advised the committee that our objective is to hit 92.5 as soon as we can. Uh, our projection is it will be the end of 2021. So you're confident that you'll meet your target within the terms of the current franchise? Yes. And is that heading in the right direction at the moment? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, as I said in my opening remarks, train service performance continues to improve uh, on Scotland's railway, and there's a huge amount of work happening uh, both in ScotRail and in Network Rail and working with other operators uh, particularly on weather resilience, as we've described, to uh, get up to 92.5 as soon as we possibly can. Mm. Okay. Um, perhaps just uh, one final question, then, because I know we have other uh, questions on the remedial plans. Um, you, you mentioned in, in uh, your opening uh, statement in response to the convener a question about the, some structural changes uh, in, mm -hmm. within the alliance or, or whatever it's referred to at the moment. Um, could you just perhaps expand on that a little bit? You talked about a change in the way that Network Rail works with its regions mm -hmm. and you seem to imply that some additional functions or 
capital responsibility had been given to ScotRail. Um, why has that happened and what effect will that have on how ScotRail is run? So, um, Network Rail is the infrastructure manager, uh, runs the infrastructure, the trap, the signalling, the bridges, the major stations. Um, also, Network Rail delivers major capital projects like Aberdeen to Inverness upgrade, but also Network Rail is responsible for the long-term planning of the railway uh, on behalf of Scottish Government. And the Scott Rail franchise is there to procure the delivery of the train service on that infrastructure. And uh, Andrew Haynes, who's the new CEO of Network Rail, uh, I think you met his predecessor, Mark Kahn. Uh, he joined Network Rail, the company, last year, and his view was uh, the uh, functions of Network Rail were overly centralised, uh, either in London or in Milton Keynes, for example. And uh, his uh, priority was to devolve more power from the centre of Network Rail to each of the five regions in Network Rail which have been created, one of which is, is Scotland. And um, the logic for that is that decisions which are made closer to the action will be better decisions than decisions that are made more remotely. So um, on uh, the 24th of June, uh, I became responsible for capital delivery, so the major enhancement projects uh, and also the long-term planning of Scotland's railway. And uh, this has been welcomed by Transport Scotland, it's been welcomed by the Scott Rail Alliance. What that enables us to do is have to have more of the levers of the railway system here in Scotland so we can make better decisions uh, for the people of Scotland. So it's a reorganisation of the network rail side of the alliance. Uh, which um, brings more of the levers of the railway into Scotland. Thank you. There's a few supplementaries there. Um, so I'm going to bring in Colin and then Stuart. And then Colin's got the question after that. So Colin, if, on this supplementary, if you'd like to come in on that. Yeah, th thanks, Kevin. I just want to double check the projections for, for, for hitting the, the, the target of 92.5, because on the 26th of March, the, the Cabinet Secretary told Parliament during topical questions and a quote from his answer here. Scott Rail's forecast for achieving the 92.5% target is that it will do so by the end of reporting period 13 in 2021 and it believes that it's on track to achieve that now. Reporting period 13 is March 2021 but what you're saying today is that you won't reach that target till the end of 2021. Have you any idea why that the Cabinet Secretary would say March 2021 but you're now saying the end of 2021? Well, it depends whether you're using a railway year or a calendar year, so proceed with caution when we're talking about period dates. Um, our target is to deliver the 92.5 as soon as possible, uh, and our position is that we will deliver uh, 92.5, or we're projected to deliver 92.5 by the end of 2021. Um, this is not an exact science, uh, and clearly some of the risks that we are managing are not within our direct control. You know, a good example, for example, is the biggest incident on Scotland's railway yesterday was a trespasser on the fourth rail bridge. Um, so this is not an exact science, it's a projection. I'm just curious as to why the Cabinet Secretary would say what is March 2021? I mean, that is the end of, that is the end of, of, of period 13. Um, that's March 2021. I'm just curious as to why the Cabinet Secretary would say that. Yeah. But you're now saying the end of 2021, which is December. You'd have to ask him that. I'm sure you'll get a chance to ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, when he comes in. Uh, I think it's next week he's coming in. Um, so, Stuart, no, you, supplementary from you. Uh, just on uh, further devolution, clearly timetabling has to be coordinated across the GB network. And you can't timetable in Scotland alone. But given that the majority of trains in Scotland operate solely on the Scottish uh, network. To what extent uh, is there an opportunity for further devolution in relation to timetabling? And in particular, uh, perhaps to shortening the period over which timetabling uh, decisions could be made, because I understand it can be quite a long lead time to make the big system uh, timetable changes. Clearly, little ones is another matter. I mean, it's a great question. 
and the devolution of timetabling um, is on the agenda uh, for, uh, for the future. So you remember that in May uh, last year, there was a collapse of the timetable south of the border uh, that led to a number of changes, including a review of the whole timetabling process. So um, timetabling was specifically not part of the first series of Andrew Haynes reforms at Network Rail because it was regarded as uh, too risky to devolve. So um, making sure we've got a robust process for planning the timetable and that it's executed well was the priority and subsequent timetable changes have gone uh, rather better. Having said that, it remains an aspiration, uh, as you uh, point, point out. You know, most of the passenger trains on, on network rails uh, infrastructure in Scotland are ScotRail, and therefore there's an opportunity for us to uh, operate things slightly different here. So what ScotRail and network rail are doing is a little pilot um, which enables uh, ScotRail to have access to the network rail train planning systems. And what that enables uh, ScotRail to do is if ScotRail wants to change its own timetable and there are no impact on any other train operating companies or indeed freight operating companies, ScotRail is able to do that. So a, a great example would be on the approaches to Queen Street Station where ScotRail is the only operator and if ScotRail wants to make some tweaks to the timetable, we've now got the ability to do that quickly and easily here from Scotland. Um, in due course, one of the things we do want to do is to reduce that planning time scale so we can be more agile, we can be uh, more um, responsive to, to market demand. Uh, and, you know, that, that will make major events planning uh, more straightforward, for example. Um, so that is uh, a future development and hopefully in the future I'll be able to report to the committee that uh, further devolution has happened in that area. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question actually is from the Deputy Convener, Maureen. Maureen. Thank you, Convener. <coughs> it must have been sometime between 2011 and 2014 um, that the government and the industry agreed that the commuter trains between Edinburgh and Glasgow were not suitable for journeys, a uh, 40 minute journey, were not suitable for two hour plus journeys to Aberdeen and Inverness from the central belt. All that time we've been waiting for refurbished trains uh, that are more comfortable and um, better and um, the refurbished trains were due to begin entering service from the Central Belt to Aberdeen and Inverness from May 2018. Um, my understanding uh, and knowledge is that the, many of the HR, HSTs are still running in the classic format. How much longer will the patience of our constituents in the north be tried? Well, we are going to recreate an intercity network for long distance travel in Scotland. And in order to do that, we've procured the best high speed train that was ever built on the UK network, the high speed train. And uh, we introduced high speed train services uh, last year. Uh, and this is one area where sadly we've been let down by our suppliers. Those trains are owned by Angel Trains. Angel Trains uh, let a contract with a company called Wabtec. Uh, and their performance on the upgrading of those trains has been woeful. And Saida, to my right, spends an awful lot of her time with Angel Trains and Wabtec, uh, getting them to perform and deliver us this fantastic, iconic train, which is going to enable the creation of an intercity network Scotland, which will enable us to provide more speed, more frequency, and, and more comfort. So, Sider, it would be helpful if you could give us an update as to where you are with Angel and Wabtec, please. Sure, Alex. Um, so, as Alex said, I'm working very closely with the leasing company Angel and the supplier Wabtec, who are refurbishing these trains in Doncaster um, to get them to deliver these trains as soon as possible. Uh, we've now got seven refurbished trains in Scotland, and the eighth one is expected in the next week. Um, 
we are working very closely with Baptech to ensure that the facility that they've got in Kilmarnock is also um, helping Baptech to, you know, refurbish more coaches. So that facility facility is now um, is is live and is refurbishing coaches, which will also accelerate the delivery of the refurbished trains. Along with that, Baptech have now. Um, looked at their resource management plan and they have employed more resources to allow the, the faster delivery of the refurbishment trains. With all due respect, we discussed this same thing six months ago. So what has changed since the last time you were here? How much faster are these trains coming on online? So we are expecting two per month um, from October onwards. Um, the last date that they promised, they, they met that date, so the seven train was delivered on target. Um, there are other um, trains which are getting refurbished at the facility which for other operators, which is now coming to an end, which will also help allow WAPTEC to put more coaches through refurbishment um, and deliver on the promise that they made to, to allow more trains to be um, delivered to Scotland as soon as possible. So what's your end date? When do you expect all the fully refurbished trains to be in service on the Inverness and Aberdeen lines? By the end of June 2020, we expect all 26 intercity trains to be delivered in Scotland. Okay, thank you. So just a quick follow-up, which I've asked on before, if I may, on the high-speed trains. I think in the classic mode, they had um, the unfortunate ability to leave stuff on the track which should have been contained within the system. Is that still happening? Because that's against the agreement I believe you had with your workforce. Could you clarify that, please? So we, we've, we've made a modification to the classic uh, HSTs here, and we're continuing to work to reduce that risk. So, Saida, do you want to explain what we've done here? So, on the classic trains, we have fitted a GPS-enabled um, um, control unit which doesn't uh, allow passengers to flush um, trains uh, when they are at stations or at key bridges where the track workers mostly work. Uh, we have also engaged with Network Rail to enhance the deep cleaning of the track so the workers don't have to work under such conditions where, uh, where the waste is deposited. Um, as I said, as soon as we get the refurbished trains um, in Scotland, we get the classic trains out of service. So the first classic has already went down to Doncaster for its refurbishment program. And by the end of this year, we hope to minimise the use of classic trains um, on Scotland's network. Sorry, I, I, I might have misheard you. Could you clarify that the GPS stops it being dropped on bridges as well? Yes, it does. So over waterways, so all the waterways in the highlands uh, are protected from effluent going into them because they're protected by this GPS system? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Uh, okay, and the next question, therefore, is Stuart Stevenson. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just uh, to close off the issue of 385s, um, I, I heard there's still 10% of them still to arrive. When will the delivery be complete? So between now and the end of the year, we need all 70 for the December timetable change, uh, A, to deliver further improvement for the newly electrified routes, but also one of the fantastic things that these trains enable is the retirement of our Class 314 trains over in the West, which are uh, some of our oldest and least reliable trains don't have toilets on board, for example. So there's a double win there. Uh, both for customers who will experience the Hitachi trains themselves, but also customers who will um, not have to travel on 314s anymore. Um, Saida works very closely with Hitachi on the delivery programme, but also on making sure that the reliability of those new trains continues to improve. And I'm delighted that uh, the 385 train here in Scotland, operated by ScotRail, is already at number two in the league table of new train introductions in terms of technical reliability. Uh, and we want to be in top spot uh, on that league table. So, Saida, it would be helpful to explain to the committee the work we're doing with Hitachi to improve the technical reliability of that train. Yes, so just on the acceptance, we've got the next three units here in Scotland which are going through the acceptance programme, so we hope to have them introduced in service um, next month as well. Um, just as Alex touched on the reliability, we have improved the reliability of the doors and um, the reliability of the communication systems with which the drivers use to operate the trains. Um, and there is a lot of investment going on um, currently with Hitachi to ensure that um, it is the best performing train in Scotland. Um, 
just to be clear then, you, you specifically said you need to get them all to implement the December timetable change. What period of time exists between the end of delivery and your acceptance process that follows that is there and the timetable change? Is it one week, two weeks, four weeks? How long is it? Just to give a sense of how much slack there is because you know, with the record of non-delivery, I think that's something in which we should take an interest. Yeah, so as I explained, the three trains um, which are going through their acceptance process are already in Scotland. They are going through their fault free running and commissioning activities. The next three will arrive next month, which will go through the same process. So before the December timetable change, uh, we will ensure that all trains are accepted. Uh, do forgive me, I'm being quite specific and I'm going to pursue this. How far before the timetable change, will you have sufficient, if not necessarily all, uh, sufficient 385s to support that timetable change, which Alec Hines said yeah. you're dependent on the 385s to make that change effectively? How much slack is there? I'm confident that by the first week of December, we will have all 385s in Scotland ready to be deployed as part of the December timetable change. And the change. timetable change is the middle of December? 15th, I think. 15th, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, the other uh, issue that there is, of course, is on recruitment training and new drivers and so on and so forth and conductors. Um, how have the numbers actually changed, particularly perhaps in, in the case of drivers, since we've more vehicles to drive? Uh, and I understand it takes a year or thereby to train a driver. So are we on schedule with that? Uh, are we getting uh, the staff in that we need? So the answer, short answer to your question is yes. Um, the 55 additional drivers which we're recruiting as part of the train service remedial plan uh, is all on track as planned. Uh, and you quite rightly point out that it takes rather a long time to train a driver because of the highly skilled nature of the job. Uh, that safety competence which we need to make sure that our drivers understand um, is specific to particular types of train and particular types uh, of route. So a depot like Edinburgh, for example, where drivers at Edinburgh drive many routes in all directions from Edinburgh, they drive many different types of trains. It can take up to 18 months to uh, bring uh, a colleague off the street and train them to be a fully uh, productive driver. We actually have uh, about 200 drivers in training uh, across ScotRail. Uh, in fact, we think we've probably got the largest driver training programme than any other train operating company in the UK. Uh, and that's a function of a number of things. One is we've got many more services to deliver for our customers in the future. We haven't stopped improving uh, the seats, the frequency, uh, the rolling stock introductions. We've got more service enhancements to come including lots of service enhancements in the North East, for example, come, come December. And we've also taken the decision that we want to reduce our reliance on overtime working to zero uh, at every depot across Scotland's railway, which is uh, driving the uh, number of uh, recruitment and training that we're doing. Uh, we have a three-year manpower plan for drivers and conductors. In fact, we're in the process of doing a five-year workforce plan uh, for ScotRail, recognising that when we do driver and conductor recruitment, a lot of that recruitment is actually from internal sources. So if we're pinching uh, trainee conductors from hospitality, for example, we need to make sure we've got uh, a good flow of our colleagues through the organisation. So uh, we've spent a lot of time going through in forensic detail our manpower planning processes to really strengthen them to A, make sure the issues that we saw uh, earlier in the year are never repeated, but also secondly, to uh, improve uh, resilience and train service performance. Uh, just a quickie final question. Um, given that drivers have to be trained on routes and have to be trained on each individual equipment, how long does it take for their validation to lapse? In other words, if they haven't driven a, well, uh, a 320 for uh, a year, does that mean they, they have to re-qualify or, or, or at least go well, back? And similarly, if they haven't covered a route for a year, do yeah. they have to re-qualify? What's the 
So um, what we do is we make sure we roster our drivers in a way that their knowledge doesn't lapse. So we move them around the train types and the routes to make sure we don't have uh, a lapse. I'll give you a good example uh, of the issue you're raising. Um, we have just finished the engineering work on the £330 million Inverness to Aberdeen project. Uh, and that project is on time and on budget and will deliver huge benefits for our customers in the North East come December. Uh, clearly, the infrastructure had changed, so essentially, after the end of the engineering project, we made sure that every driver in that part of the world had the ability to do what two comfort runs, we call them, recognising that there's been some minor changes to the infrastructure. Um, so you're absolutely right. Uh, the competence of our drivers on the routes and the traction is a key area of focus for our driver team managers. A few supplementaries here. Maureen, followed by Emma. Um, yes, the perception is, uh, listening to um, the radio and other media outlets in the morning, is that most of the cancellations are early morning. How much of that is due to uh, a member of the crew not turning up for work? And what sort of control have you got on sickness no. absence rates? So uh, the number of services we cancel due to lack of available train crew is now at very, very low levels. Uh, we promised this committee that we would fix that problem by the May timetable change, and we have. And the remedial plan, the £18 million investment which Abelio is putting in, has largely remedied that issue. One of the issues that we have at start of day is sometimes uh, we have the late um, completion of engineering work. And one of the things we have done in the last nine months is to really strengthen our processes around uh, safe and reliable and on-time handback of the track from engineering work into operation. And that's a key area of focus for Liam and his team. And it's probably worthwhile saying that the number of overruns and PPM failures we have due to that cause has dramatically reduced in recent times and Liam's got plans to improve our performance further in that area. I don't know whether there's anything more you want to say. Yeah, I can do. So that's, I think that's a really frustrating thing that happens at the start of the day because that's when all of our units and our drivers are in the right place to start the journey for passengers. And you know what? I also think if passengers are, are up at 5 o'clock, uh, 5.30 in the morning to get an early train, it's even more frustrating for those to be delayed. So we've recognised that in Network Rail. We cannot allow our engineering work to overrun. And we've introduced some new processes that speed up the, the taking of access at the start of the engineering work, um, which means we can guarantee that work being done. And as Alex said, we've, we've actually reduced um, the, the causes of delay associated with that dramatically to the extent that um, it's been, I think, six weeks since the last one of those instances. And that instance was only a very, very minor, very minor delay in the morning. So that's part of, um, part of the work that we're doing to help Scott Rail services to get off to a good start in the morning. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Emma. Thank you, conveners. Just a quick sup, um, because uh, we've described intercity rail links and then uh, north-east connections as well. I'm interested in what the plans are for the south-west of Scotland. Um, I get um, complaints about uh, the lack of faster lines is affecting our ability to recruit doctors to the region. So I'm interested to hear about how, uh, what the plans are with all these drivers coming on board and increased conductors between Stranraer, for instance, and Ayr, and Dumfries and Glasgow. So how can we see an improvement for the South West? Okay. Well, in recent years, we have delivered some good train service improvements in the South West. Uh, for example, we uh, doubled the frequency of train service between Dumfries and Carlisle, for example, um, a few timetable uh, periods ago. Um, we, in that part of the world, south of Air, the train service is operated by diesel trains. Uh, and we know there's a UK-wide shortage of diesel trains. So that's one of the things that inhibits our ability to uh, expand the train service in that part of the world. Having said that, as the train fleet gets bigger, 
that gives us more service enhancement options. And of course, one of the questions we need to ask ourselves, particularly in the light of yesterday's announcement by the Scottish Government around decarbonising Scotland's railway by 2035, is whether we actually want to electrify the line south of air. That's something we should think about as a country. And that will enable the improvements which your constituents uh, are looking for. Thank, thank you. Uh, the next question is Peter. Peter. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, good morning, Alex. I mean, the, I want to move on to the remedial plan too, because Abelia was issued with a second remedial plan noticed by Transport Scotland on the 8th of February 2019 for failing to meet customer satisfaction targets set out in the franchise agreement. So just to explore some of that, I mean, one of the issues was uh, a declining satisfaction by your customers of, of train cleanliness, for instance. And I, I, I note that you're planning to, amongst other things, to uh, initiate deep cleaning of all carriages on a 120-day uh, rotation rather than 180 days, as, as is currently happening. So I assume that you will, there will be a need for more cleaning staff. Is that, is that part of the plan? Or, or how many extra folk do you reckon you need to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, train cleanliness is the second most important driver of customer satisfaction after train service punctuality. Mm. And it's an area we've been focused on heavily in recent months because it's one of the key things which is measured by the Squire regime, which, as we know, is one of the toughest uh, service quality regimes anywhere in the UK. And I was pleased to report that in August, when we published our latest Squire performance, our Squire uh, results improved by 43%. So this is a key area of focus for us. We continue to invest further in train cleanliness. So, for example, we have implemented travelling cleaners on the main Edinburgh to Glasgow route, mm -hmm. uh, given the volume of customers we have on that route and the requirement to clean those uh, more light clean those trains more frequently. And as part of the £4 million investment which Abellio is making in the customer satisfaction remedial plan, we've committed to retain those travelling cleaners which we put in at our own expense until the end of the franchise. You quite rightly say that in addition to daily cleaning, which we do uh, during the day and at uh, end of day, uh, we do what are called planned heavy cleans and we're going to do those more frequently in the future than we do currently. And uh, Saida is responsible as the engineering director for Scotland Rail around the train cleaning operation, and as well as making sure people like Wabtec and Angel deliver, uh, clearly making sure we're providing uh, safe, clean, reliable trains for Scotland Rail is, uh, is her job, in fact. Um, so, Saida, I don't know whether you want to explain what we're doing in the cleaning area. Yes, so thanks, Alex. Um, as Alex explained, we have recruited additional cleaners as part of our uh, pit stop clean, which effectively you know, travels on the trains and um, do cleaning whilst the trains are in service. We've also recruited additional cleaners at new locations, such as Miller Hill, um, because it's a new depot. The 385s get stable there overnight. Um, also, rem remote locations, such as Tweed Bank and Larnock, we have got, place, we've got plans in place to recruit additional cleaners to help with the cleaning overnight. So we are continually growing our our train presentation team um, to ensure that the standards are met. Mm. It appears that the, the travelling, uh, the cleaners travelling on the train have been a huge success. Have you, have you any plans to increase that onto other routes or are you just going to stick where you are? Uh, we are looking into the, the Glasgow suburban routes as well because that's an area where the, the passenger satisfaction, um, you know, the, 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 the results showed that the passengers were not satisfied in those routes, so we are looking to expand on those routes as well. Very good, thanks. Just to, to look at another issue, the, the, the remedial plan also highlights the creation of an 18-strong customer action team and a 12-strong team of complaint specialists. Now, these are, as I understand it, not to be new posts. These are amongst, from amongst existing ScotRail staff. Mm -hmm. So what Im impact will, will the creation of these teams have on the tasks that these staff presumably are, are carrying out right now? Mm. 
So uh, two things there. One is the customer action team, which will go live shortly. So essentially, uh, if we have major disruption, particularly in the Glasgow area, which is where the ScotRail HQ is, what we will do is have a dedicated team of train managers who we can send into the major stations at Glasgow to support our frontline colleagues in the event of uh, major disruption. So that's um, helping our frontline employees, uh, supporting customers with information and generally providing providing better customer service and visibility. So that's part of our remedial plan. In addition, uh, we employ a team of uh, very highly trained professionals, uh, again in Glasgow, who process our customer contacts, including uh, the administration of the delay repay guarantee. And by working with that team, what we've identified is an opportunity is rather than for customers to claim post-event in the event of things going wrong, actually we can bring that team to the customers in real time and help them through their claim on iPads. Mm. Uh, and that's actually great for the customer. Uh, it's proactive, it's us doing their work. Mm. Um, it means we can um, deliver the money back as soon as we can, but it also helps backlogs occurring later uh, at the shared service centre. Mm. Uh, it's worthwhile saying that um, not only do we employ 500 more people uh, in ScotRail than we did at the start of the franchise, actually Abellio's UK headquarters uh, is in Glasgow and it employs uh, nearly 200 people in Glasgow, uh, which is a function of Abellio operating uh, the franchise. So it's not just uh, the ScotRail activity, which is getting uh, bigger and providing more well-skilled and well-paid jobs for Scotland. Actually, the existence of Abellio UK's headquarters and shared service centre is also providing employment for Scotland as well. Okay. Thanks. There's a few supplementaries, so I'm going to bring in Colin and then Richard. Colin. Th thanks, Convener. Um, according to your remedial plan, you're projected this year to remain below the, the customer satisfaction target um, set out in the franchise agreement. So I think the projection is 84% for 2019-20. Uh, this year, you obviously hit 79%, but the franchise agreement says the target is 88.5%. Now, according to the franchise, and I'm going to quote from the text here, if overall satisfaction does not meet the overall passenger satisfaction target in any two consecutive franchise years, such shall constitute a continuing and material event of default, and the authority shall be entitled to terminate this agreement by serving a termination notice on the franchise. So can you just confirm that, that what the remedial plan seems to be saying is that you will, in effect, be in default of the franchise? Sorry, where are you quoting from there? I'm quoting the actual text of the franchise agreement um, okay. that says that effectively that if you don't hit the target on customer satisfaction two years running, it's a material event of default. And obviously, a, a, an event, event of default um, allows the, 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 um, the, the franchise to be terminated. That, so that, that, that sounds correct. Essentially, the way the contract works is uh, it puts uh, many thousands of obligations on ScotRail, the vast majority of which have been delivered. And in the event of not hitting targets in the franchise agreement, there is a process of remedy and escalation uh, and with, with varying consequences. So uh, you're right, in extremis, um, failure to hit targets can be an event of default and uh, the uh, Transport Scotland could issue a, a notice of termination um, if our performance uh, fell below certain levels. But it's not going to because we're investing £22 million worth of Abellio's money in improving train service performance and customer satisfaction uh, to give our customers increasingly the service they expect and deserve. But, but, but let's be clear, your remedial plan projects that passenger satisfaction for 2019-20 um, will be 84%. That's what your remedial plan projects, so that's what you think it will be. But the franchise agreement says it should be 88.5%. So that means you're projecting to fail to meet the franchise agreement next year. So that's two years running that you'll fail to meet the franchise agreement. And if you fail to meet the franchise agreement two years running, that's, that's an event of default. Is that not the case? So you're actually projecting to fail to meet the franchise agreement. Well, this remedial plan, um, in effect, 
becomes the way to improve service back up to target. That's that's the way the process works. So clearly, um, it, you know, we, we don't want the franchise to be default. We don't want it to be terminated. What we want to do, do is deliver a great service for customers. So rather than terminate the franchise, the answer is to invest to fix the problem. And that's what we're doing. But so therefore, there's no point in setting a franchise target if, if, if we're saying we're not going to meet that. But it, just even in even in the third year, so that's a year after you would be in default of the franchise. Even in the third year, you're projecting that you'll reach. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the region of eight to eight percent. And again, that's below the franchise agreement of eight to eight point five percent. Now, to be fair, to help you along the way, Transport Scotland have suddenly reduced the franchise target for uh, for, for future years to eight to seven point five percent, which coincidentally is slightly below what you're projecting to reach for eight uh, for, 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 for 2020-21, which is 8 to 8 per cent. But that's three years running. You're effectively projecting to fail to meet the franchise agreement. I mean, at what point do the, the franchise get terminated, do you think? If, you, if you're simply projecting you're constantly going to fail to meet the franchise agreement, what is the point of, of actually having franchise targets if you're, you're, you're failing to meet them? Well, our primary focus is to deliver a great service for our customers. And what triggered the remedial plan was an overall satisfaction score on the NRPS survey of 79%, which was clearly not acceptable to anybody, uh, including me and my team. So it's already recovered to 85%, uh, which is higher than the GB average. Uh, we have the most satisfied customers of any of the large operators in the UK and we're going to drive that score up uh, even further. And the reason why Transport uh, Scotland have adjusted the target is nothing to do with helping the franchisee or ScotRail. It's because Transport Focus changed the methodology on which the National Rail Passenger Survey was created. I'm sorry, I'm going to let you push it one more time and then I, I feel I must move on to other committee members. So, uh, I, I, another I, I, go, if you like. And I'm sure it is a coincidence that the, that the Transport Scotland have changed the target to 87.5 and you're projecting 8 to 8, which is just above it and, and no more. But you do accept, though, that you are in default of the franchise because you have failed to deliver that target two years running or you're projecting to fail to deliver that target two years running. So... Uh, I think the way it works legally is we're not in default because we've agreed a remedial plan, okay. which is why we're investing £22 million in improving train sales performance and customer satisfaction, which I think is what our customers want. I think I am going to move on, Colin, uh, and bring in Richard before I come to Emma for yeah, the next question. The doom and gloom. Um, <laughs> I, actually think, I actually think we actually have a, a good train service. I actually like to travel on a train. You and I have discussed, don't want to skip stop, want a decent seat, want to pay a decent price. The other thing you, maybe I, I want to ask you that no one's, I think, ever asked you, we've, other, we've got other transport in Scotland, buses, planes and ferries. Have you ever done a comparison between how ScotRail compares between bus delays and plane de delays? I personally haven't, but one of the things uh, which, uh, as a railway person, I often uh, reflect on is the transparency of our performance information and how tight those targets are. So uh, we measure uh, every single train, every single day. Uh, it has to arrive at its destination within four minutes, 59 uh, of its scheduled time, having called at all stations. Uh, that's a pretty uh, you know, challenging target. It's a great target to have. Um, how many car journeys achieve that uh, objective over the same distances? Which I think is why... Uh, people are so positive about the rail network in Scotland. It's why Scottish Government continues to invest record amounts. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't dream of using my car during the week. Uh, rail travel is by far the most civilised form of travel, and we're going to make it even better. Yeah, it would be interesting to know what, how many planes have been delayed, uh, um, I think, the last couple of days over... France due to yeah. a technical hitch in and France. I think they, they measure their performance time to 15, I yeah. think. 
I think it may be something that Richard's uh, parliamentary researcher may be able to follow up, because oh. uh, I'm not sure we'll get the answer <laughs> in this committee. Um, Emma, I'm going to move on to you uh, for you the next I, question. Please. I'll stick with Richard's uh, positivity and uh, infectious objectivity. I'm interested in the uh, introduction of technology as part of the remedial plan and to aid in communication when there uh, might be disruptions to um, to the, the journeys and everything. So, but I'm interested in the, what practical difference do you expect that the creation of one new customer information post and the rollout of the, um, of the smartphones to staff, uh, how has that had uh, a positive experience on, uh, on uh, people's journeys across the network? So there's, there's two issues here. So Obviously now uh, every station in Scotland apart from Dunrobin Castle has a real-time customer, customer information system and the information which uh, drives those systems is pushed out essentially from the two customer information security centres we have on Scotland's railway, one at Paisley and one at Dunfermline. And we recently invested heavily in both of those facilities uh, to improve the accuracy and the speed of information. And as part of this remedial plan exercise, we identified an opportunity to improve the delivery of uh, information to the customer information schemes at, at weekends, for example. So one of our customer information desks had two people on it Monday to Friday, but only one person on a Saturday. So we're going to uh, double shift that to make sure in the event of two incidents happening at the same time, for example, we're able to process that, uh, process that information more quickly. So that's the stuff we do uh, remotely, and they are the most advanced uh, customer information security centres anywhere on the UK rail network, fantastic facilities. Um, in addition, clearly, we have uh, thousands of frontline colleagues. Um, we have at least two people on board uh, every train, and clearly providing face-to-face -face visible customer service uh, to our customers at all times, uh, but particularly uh, in, in disruption is, is, is a key uh, focus. So making sure that all our people have a smart device, they know how to use it, they've got access to the information is a key part of our plan. And uh, the £4 million investment that we're making, actually the majority of it, around about £2 million, is uh, the cost of issuing every member of staff with a new smart device and then training them how to use the, the uh, apps and the information on those devices to deliver better customer information to customers. So that's at the heart of our plan, is to make sure our frontline people, who in the main are absolutely fantastic, they have the tools to do the job to look after our customers at all times. Okay, thanks. And in your opening statement, you mentioned the WhatsApp mobile app mm -hmm. as well. And uh, I'm interested if, if you have evidence that using the WhatsApp app um, to disseminate information during periods that are really busy or any disruptions, mm. that how does that um, has mm. that been taken up? How are yeah. people using the WhatsApp? I mean, it's a great question because we only launched it on Monday, but actually we're already getting some really useful customer insight. So, for example, uh, in ScotRail, we have an award-winning Twitter team. Uh, you know, ScotRail is fantastic at social media. Uh, we've recently been recruiting uh, more people in that team to support the enhanced hours of operation. So, we now start at 5.30 uh, in the morning and we operate until midnight. So, uh, pretty much while trains are running, we have our social media team uh, in operation and they uh, primarily use Twitter and Facebook uh, which of course is social media and young people in, the, in general are comfortable using uh, social media and what we're already recognising is that people who are using the WhatsApp channel uh, generally tend to be a little bit older than the people who are using the social media channels. So already we're making this fantastic team more accessible to all different parts of society. So it was launched on Monday and you'll continue to monitor yep. the uptake and the engagement just we, to make uh, sure it's working? Absolutely. I mean, we, we monitor our social media all the time. We get daily data on it. We monitor customer sentiment in real time. 
and every morning at about 10.30 an email goes out to every single manager on Scotland's Railway which says this is what our customers said about us on social this morning and it's immensely powerful customer insight and we use that information to improve the service we provide. Okay, thanks. Um, John Finney, you wanted a supplementary followed by Jamie Green. If, if I may, I wanted to make a, a brief comment about the social and, and then a, ask a question. And an actual example that you may or may not recall, Mr Hines, and that was over the weekend, I think, one of my constituents complained that at Inverness there was uh, a, a fault that resulted in the three of the ticket machines not working. Very quickly, your staff got back and said, we've managed to resolve the issue and two of them are working, we'll get the other one sorted as quickly as possible. The individual remained unhappy. I mean, I personally thought it was a first-class response. How does that filter in? Because I know on a previous occasion you gave us an example of someone who had a, a perfect journey but gets off the train and um, something goes wrong when they're off the train and the reflection the whole episode had been negative. So is there any way of analysing that? Because there is a, you know, overwhelmingly the experience is very positive in the railway, I would say. So there's a couple of things there. So I do remember that uh, incident. Um, and one of the things we've been working really hard on is the reliability of our ticket vending machines, which has improved hugely uh, in my time in Scotland's railway. Uh, and it's one reason why our Squire uh, performance is improving 43% better uh, the last time we delivered the results. And then, of course, we're getting better at handling uh, customer feedback um, when... Uh, when customers have issues, it's not just issues, it's actually suggestions. So, for example, we went live with WhatsApp uh, on Monday and uh, people with reduced mobility are saying, well, can I use that channel to book my assistance, for example? And that's the sort of thing we're looking at uh, as we speak. But we've got very precise measurement. Uh, if I check my email now, I could tell you what the social sentiment was for ScotRail, positive, negative and neutral from this morning. There has to be a deeper analysis of that in some respect, though, isn't it? Because it, it, mm. someone might be negative, but actually they're negative about one aspect rather than the whole experience. Can I, can I just uh, go back and, and make a link with the, the questions you asked about the identification of the fault in the West Highland line? Mm -hmm. That was a human that did that, notwithstanding mm -hmm. all that. Can you give an assurance that, welcome though it is, this expansion of social media and all these different methods, won't mean that we're not going to have a human presence at stations because to certain people that's what they want they want to see the white of the eyes and understand mm -hmm. rather than yeah. mess about on a phone like you and i might be comfortable with so absolutely what what customers say to us is that they love our people so our most important task is to make sure that our people are well informed and visible and helpful and friendly and that's one of the reasons why we employ 500 more people now than we did on the first day of the franchise Thank you very much. Okay, uh, <coughs> Jamie Green, followed then by Peter Chapman. Th thanks. I just wanted to pick up uh, some things that haven't been mentioned, which are probably you know, less exciting, but it's still quite important. One is the decision to scrap the bike and go scheme. Uh, it seems quite disappointing that the take up was very low on that, and I appreciate the commercial decision that was made, but I just wondered if you had any thoughts on why it was so uh, unsuccessful. And also, you haven't mentioned uh, today. Uh, what's been done to improve the uh, delay repay uh, program because I think uh, there's perhaps there's still a perception I certainly think some some surveys pointed out that there's perhaps a lack of awareness still on how passengers get refunds and how that process is I believe there was some conversation recently about uh, the amount of steps that passengers had to go through and the amount of pieces of information they have to provide to get a refund uh, it seems uh, unacceptable to some Okay, so the reason why uh, Abellio is closing the bike and go scheme, not just in ScotRail but in its other operations in the UK, is because the usage was very low. That does not mean Abellio is not committed to cycling and active travelling. In fact, we continue to invest huge sums of money. Uh, we have a dedicated cycling manager, we have a cycling forum, we're continuing to invest in better facilities at stations for cycle storage uh, and, of course, on board. And one of the things that is really exciting, which we're going to deliver uh, in due course, 
is a carriage which will uh, be used for the conveyance of cycles on the scenic lines during summer periods. So um, on the West Highland line, for example, going to Fort William, mountain bike capital of the UK, uh, will have the ability to carry bikes in a dedicated carriage. So we're completely committed to cycling despite the fact that the bike and go um, scheme is closing. On delay repay, uh, you're referring there to the WITCH uh, report, and it's fair to say the WITCH report took a worst case scenario in terms of the number of steps that customers have to take to claim delay repay. Claiming delay repay is dead easy. Uh, it's a guarantee that if your journey is delayed by 30, more, uh, 30 minutes or more, we will get your money back to you uh, quickly. And uh, the way we administer delay repay here is we remember our customers' details, we remember our uh, customers' tickets' details, and therefore, on subsequent events, the customer only has to add the journey detail. So uh, if you take a worst-case scenario and a single claim, there are a number of steps customers have to go to. One of the reasons why we do that is to make it so easy to claim uh, for future claims because it remembers who they are and as part of this remedial plan we're going to publicize uh, the existence of that scheme more widely what we're finding is that for a given level of disruption the number of delay repay claims is going up so that's evidence that awareness of the scheme is rising and um, the teams we will send down to major stations in major disruption uh, will help improve the claim rate. But we're also, as part of the remedial plan that's set out in the document you've got a copy of, um, going to distribute, I think, 115,000 little handy credit card sized uh, pieces of information that uh, commuters in particular can keep in their wallets so they know exactly how to claim uh, the delay repay guarantee. Can I just check, so if I, if I buy a ticket at a station, I haven't registered, I haven't done it online, you don't know who I am, I've got a paper ticket, my train's delayed, at which point will a member of staff say to me, by the way, you're eligible for a refund? Will it come up on the screen? Will it be announced? Will the conductors mention it? Will there be staff at the other end to give me a form? Yeah. So, essentially, if a train is delayed by more than 30 minutes, that tra triggers the delay repay um, uh, right. Uh, our staff will announce it. It will be on CIS, uh, uh, customer information screens at stations. And of course, we publicize it through the social channels. And you'll see more of us doing that in terms of actually physically handing customers a reminder uh, when those events happen. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Peter, yours is the next question. Yeah. Um, in the plan, the commitments relating to personal safety and security only relate to passenger awareness raising mm. rather than tackling issues of concern at stations and on the train. And, uh, and you know, rightly or wrongly, I think there is an increasing level of concern about personal safety as we travel. And can you outline what practical measures you are taking to improve mm. passenger safety mm -hmm. at stations and, and on the train? So our approach in this area is focused on two issues. One is to improve the actual safety and security of Scotland's Railway, and the other is to improve the perception of the safety and security of Scotland's Railway. Mm -hmm. So Scotland's Railway is safe, um, it's getting safer, we're investing more resources uh, in making sure that the rail network is safe and secure. So a good example of that is the investment we've made in body cameras, for example, for our frontline staff, uh, which is voluntary uh, for our people to use. Some use it, some don't. It's being used more frequently, and the quality of the video and the audio we get off those body cameras is seriously impressive and um, is of prosecution standard. Mm. So making sure we use those sorts of uh, uh, technologies to enable our people to feel confident and to be visible, but also make sure that we uh, prosecute people properly when they um, put our staff or customers at risk is, is right up there. And uh, our security manager, um, it, it, that's his job. 
Um, but what we found uh, by analysing the customer data, which we get from the National Rail Passenger Survey, was actually um, the perception of security was actually where the main issue was. So we're going to be doing a lot of communications in the coming months and years to make sure that our customers are more aware of the fact that we've got these two fantastic facilities at Paisley and Dunfermline, which are staffed 24-7 with fantastic uh, CCTV systems and they're watching remotely the network at all times. So you'll see us do a lot more information uh, on that so customers can feel more secure uh, using our network. Mm. I can see the body cameras being a, a huge advantage. Why, why is it uh, not a compulsory for, them, for your staff to, to have them? Well, some people don't feel the need to, to wear them. Mm. Um, and some people, I think, are un uncomfortable with the, the concept. Um, so at the moment, it's voluntary. Uh, we don't have any plans to make it permanent. But what um, percentage of your with, staff are, with, are wearing with, them? With the rollout of um, with the rollout of new technology, there's always the early adopters and the late adopters. So uh, we don't measure the percentage of staff. Uh, wearing them easily because it's not personal equipment. Essentially what we do is we make a number of body camera devices available at each of the booking on and booking off location mm. uh, across Scotland's railway network. So we measure uh, the use of the devices rather than the, you know, whether individual staff have got their own mm. personal equipment. It's not a personal issue. All right. And uh, the, the, the plan, they've got, you've got a budget of something like 3.9 million for the plan. I think you did say that one of the big expenditures on that is the, the smartphones, but yeah. can you explain just wh where else the, the 3.9 million is being spent and what that will provide? So in the plan somewhere is a table which sets out the expenditure by commitment, uh, but it funds the things like the additional staff in the control centres, uh, the additional train cleaning uh, mm. resource. Mm. Um, so it's mainly around investment in additional people. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and the penultimate questions, I think, are going to Mike. Mike. Good morning. Um, You've touched earlier on on the Squire Fund, and um, that's a service quality incentive scheme for those listening. In your earlier answers, and I've, I've, but I've got some specific questions on this incentive scheme fund. Over the last nine quarters, the average penalties that you've been hit with for missing targets on such things as cleanliness in stations, cleanliness on trains, litter, passenger information displays and public address systems has been over £1 million per quarter. That's over the last nine quarters. So could you tell me, first of all, how much money is currently in the fund? So I think the total um, amount in the fund from the start of the franchise to today is in the region of £14 million. Uh, about £11 million of that has been spent, so there's something like £3 million remaining in the fund. Million. But clearly that is a dynamic total. Um, my main focus is to reduce uh, the squire penalties <laughs> uh, and I'm really pleased with the performance of the team on that front, 43% better at the latest results. And the other thing is making sure that when there are monies in the fund we use those to fix the issues that our customers want fixed. Um, and indeed our frontline colleagues. So, for example, the investment we made in body cameras was funded from the Squire Fund. Okay. I mean, I have mixed feelings about the Squire Fund, of course. I think as, as, as passengers, we want to see that Squire Fund reduced, so the penalties that you receive, absolutely. But there are benefits. I mean, you've mentioned one of them there with the cameras, but in my area, for instance, as an example, uh, we've been uh, interested in making sure there's disabled access, for instance, at Inch Station and other stations on the Aberdeen... <coughs> I believe the Inverness line where there currently isn't disabled access and I mm. understand that this fund can be used for purposes like that. Yes. That is the case, isn't it? It can be. Uh, one of the challenges we face is that the cost of accessibility at stations is uh, very expensive. Indeed. Um, 
and so one of the challenges we have is the amount of money left in the fund wouldn't be sufficient for example to build uh, a new DDA footbridge for example yeah, at a station but what it can be used for is minor um, accessibility issues like handrails ramps um, those sorts of things which can make a big difference to people with re reduced mobility it, it, it can indeed and that's one of the issues that we could use the, the, this fund for and I'm glad you're very well aware of that particular particular issue so but our, our intention of course should be everybody's intention should be to reduce this fund to the absolute minimum so you're no longer uh, being hit with penalties because after all it's about the service that you require and I do notice from the last quarter well, the average from the nine quarters has been a million pounds penalties that you faced. The last quarter has reduced to two thirds of a million. Do you think that will be projected to reduce much further? Well, I mean, I, I will not rest until that number is zero. Right. Uh, okay. And That's we have. Fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm <laughs> looking around the rest of the committee. So, uh, I think my final question is, is actually a request uh, to you, Alex, that uh, you'd be disappointed if you got away from coming to one of these committees without talking about skip stopping. Um, and I certainly asked you a question on skip stopping at the last uh, committee meeting, and you didn't have the figures to hand. So I no, no doubt sure you have the, uh, the figures to hand to skip stopping across the network. So rather than ask you to go through them all now, um, perhaps you could write to the committee and let them know the last skip stopping events that have happened on the network in the last three months uh, and break them down as where possible where they happened so we're aware because it is a real issue to people that are affected by this and uh, if I could have an undertaking from you that you'll do that promptly uh, I'm, I'm happy I'm, to, to I'm, move on it. I'm happy to meet that request, uh, not least it will show that we don't skip stop ordinarily on Scotland's Railway anymore. We only do it as a last resort and as a result the number of times it happens is down by 80%. Perfect and we can look at the figures when they come in, so thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank you uh, for uh, coming to give evidence. The committee will be coming I think on the 16th of September uh, to the control centre or members of the committee will. Uh, I was looking at this uh, yesterday and, uh, and how I'm going to get down and it was a question of whether it was a six hours on a train and, and two, possibly three changes or four hours in my car. I'm sure that I will likely to go by train so that I will be uh, on time for this event and we'll look forward to see you on the 16th of September and thank you for giving evidence. Committee, I'm going to briefly suspor uh, suspend the meeting for five minutes before we go into the next session. Thank you very much.
Thank you. We'll now move on to uh, agenda item four, which is public petitions, and this is uh, petition P01703. And the committee will consider this petition by Hugh McClellan on behalf of the Laid Grazings and Community uh, uh, Committee on Access to Broadband in Rural Scotland. Um, and I would just ask uh, if, the, if there's any members of the committee who wish to pass comment on this. There are a few. So uh, Richard Lyle, Stuart Stevenson, uh, Jamie Green, and, and that will start us off. Yes, in regards, thank you, Kandira. In regards to this petition, I certainly uh, support um, the comments being made. And I notice the petitioner has cited the example of the, the village which does not have broadband. But over the page, going over, it says the Scottish Government response indicates that a, a new fibre cable through the village of Laid was installed as part of the Digital Scotland Supervised Broadband programme. So, can I ask if we can ask? Uh, BT, can this cable be uh, used? Can it be accessed? Or is it a case that this cable just runs through the village and no one can use it? I, I'm very... Um, I'd, I'd like to know more. I, I, I think that actually the information is in there that said that the, the, the cable's there, but it's not commercially viable, was my understanding, uh, for, well, for other well, users to use The it. question surely is, why not? If, if a cable, it's like a gas main, if a gas main runs through a village, surely you can access it. If a cable runs through a village, why, why can't you access it? I see some people shaking their heads. OK, Richard, I'm not even going to attempt to, to answer whether it's commercially viable, but I take that point, and maybe we can suggest an outcome. Can I, Stuart, you had a point, and then Jamie Green. Um, well, Camilla, my, my, my starting point is that I think the, uh, uh, the uh, petition should be kept open. We shouldn't contemplate closing it at this meeting. Uh, and my reason for saying that is that uh, uh, while it uh, is a UK government responsibility, um, this kind of telecoms, the delivery vehicle um, in practical terms is, is, is the, the, the Scottish government and indeed to uh, support the rural areas. Um, the 600 million R100 programme is exactly the same amount of money that the UK government has spent on uh, wiring up the whole of the rest of the UK. Uh, so uh, there is a commitment to do it. But I think the appropriate time uh, to consider closing uh, this petition is when the information becomes available about when uh, the people in these areas and in other areas, such as my own premises, I hasten to add, um, it will be able to ask for and get delivered uh, the, the fibre-enabled and even better direct fibre to the premises service. And until that is available, I think it wouldn't be appropriate to close uh, this perfectly proper and reasonable uh, petition that is before us today. Okay, Stuart. Uh, Jamie, uh, followed by Colin. Thank, thank you, Convener. Uh, just a few comments. One, first, is that I think that's uh, entirely appropriate this committee um, considers the petition given the, the remit of the committee. Uh, I agree with uh, my colleague, Mr. Stevenson, that the, the petition should be kept open uh, uh, in light of um, uh, perhaps a lack of uh, clarity at the moment uh, to the committee in terms of some of the timetabling. Uh, I do believe, however, that the Cabinet Secretary is responsible for this. Uh, uh, it will be given evidence to the committee, which may provide some further information, which will help the petitioner. But I also think that the, the, the petition should not be closed uh, at the point that that information is available. I think it would be far more beneficial that the petition is closed when some of the real-time information is available around uh, uh, household and business accessibility to, uh, to super-fast broadband. I also think within the wording of the petition itself, um, it, there is perhaps some debate around what constitutes super fast uh, and whether or not before 2021 means by 2021 or by the end of 21. So there may be some uh, issues to consider around the wording of, of what the petition is calling for, but nonetheless it seems quite appropriate, sensible and indeed wise to keep it open until we as a committee have further information. Thank you, Jeremy. Colin. Thanks very much, Gary I'm very keen to keep this um, 
petition uh, open. I think uh, I think there's an important principle here. I mean, rural communities are more often than not the ones that are that are always forced to play catch up when it comes to the role of broadband. Whatever the initiative is, um, it's often and always usually the rural communities are the ones that are left behind, and uh, they are often the, the economies that have the most challenges. Um, so, if we're serious about inclusive growth, when it does come to the role of, of R100, um, that 2021 20, date should be seen as a very last date, not one that all rural communities should expect to fall into line with eventually after our cities have. Um, so I think it's an important principle here um, that communities in rural areas uh, deserve to be heard when it comes to what is a competitive disadvantage they have compared to our cities in the role of broadband. So I'm keen to see this um, petition uh, remain open uh, as, as the R100 plans are developed. Thank you. Uh, John Finney, followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, uh, Kavina. Uh, members might well be very surprised where you get very good uh, um, connectivity and where you don't. And uh, um, uh, Mr. Stevenson touched on this earlier, and uh, I would think it would be appropriate the committee writes to the appropriate UK government minister, given that this is uh, a UK matter. I think the Scottish government have built a, a severe rod for their own um, backs with regard to this. So I would like to hear what the UK government minister with responsibility for this has to say on, on the petition. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mike? Well, considering that, we've already heard from the Cabinet Secretary that um, they've moved the date by R100 will reach every business and household to the end of 2021. I notice that this petition is asking for it before 2021, and that's a whole 12 months difference. And for a lot of businesses, 12 months is a very important period. So I'm sure our businesses throughout rural Scotland are looking forward to receiving this this level of broadband coverage. But it is crucial as to when they're going to be expected. And so I think that's a major issue that we need to delve into further, and whether any then whether the targets can be brought back to what the original target was, which was before 2021. So I'm very keen to keep this open. Okay, um, Maureen. Just one small thing, convener. Um, you know, there are uh, a number of community broadband uh, initiatives and possibilities. Um, I wonder if some work could be done to find out, you know, whether these have been explored and if not, why not? Okay, I think... Yes. I mean, I thought we heard previously that a lot of these initiatives are not now being taken up because of the commitment. I mean, why, why would a community... Um, invest in a huge amount of money in these projects when they know it's coming down the track. The only, the only question is when are they going to get it? Okay. So that's why it's stalled. Can, can, can I make a su suggestion here? I mean, what, what, what's clear just on the cabling is, is uh, just to clarify that, is that our, our R100 bidders will be, will be given access to that cabling that goes through the village. I think that's my reading of the papers. And, and, and hearing what people are saying around the table, well, if I can try and summarise, Richard, and, and then ask people if they agree with my proposal to take it forward, is, is that we are in the situation where the uh, Cabinet Secretary will be announcing her preferred big bidders at the end of September, which will mean that there will be a time probably towards the end of October when it would be appropriate for this committee to ask him to come forward and explain what's happening on the R100 pro project and when that's going to be delivered, because a lot of the questions have been uh, on delivery times, and this petition is on the delivery time. So my proposal at this stage would be to recommend the, to the committee that we keep the petition open uh, because it's appropriate to do so, and we wait to see what further action we take, undertake uh, once the Cabinet Secretary's been in, which will be roughly at the period of the end of October. But it slightly depends on when, when the committee can find a slot for him to come in. Would the committee agree with that in principle? Richard. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree, but the point I made right at the very start, if there is a BT cable running through that village, we also have to ask BT why it's not supplying um, uh, broadband, super-fast broadband to each and every uh, uh, house, business, whatever. You know, BT are on uh, radio all the time saying about, you know, get, get this super-fast broadband, get an extra of this into your room and all that jazz. So let's ask BT why this petitioner can't get his super-fast broadband. Well, I, I, I actually 
uh, would suggest, Richard, that, that, that that's a question we'd like to ask the Minister on, on access to it, because it's not just this community, it's, it's lots of other people. We've got to ask the company. We've yes. got to ask the company also. I, I've said before, my own house at, at Kildrummy there, the cable comes right past the front door, but I can't access it. It's the same situation here. It's very simple that, that there isn't an access off, the, off that. So it's a completely different, I'm afraid it is a little well, bit of a red herring. Uh, can, can, I, can I suggest that this, this along with everyone else who, who has got cables near the house, is a matter that we really should take up with the, with the minister responsible for this when he talks about R100 to the committee? Because this is going to be a problem across all of Scotland. I'm not getting the full answer. If we're not asking BT, British Telecom, over the years many companies have, have had hundreds of millions of pounds to invest in different types of cable, copper, fibre, you name it, uh, under, the, under the, the, the pavements. At the end of the day, we should also be asking BT, what are they doing about it? And, it, and that exactly the, the situation that Mike Rumbles highlights also. Okay. Um, is there other members of the committee that, that would take Mr. Lyle's point of view, or are there other members of the committee that, that would prepare? I mean, I'm very happy to put it to a vote, Mr. Lyle, if, if you'd like. I'm sure. Well, well, I, I would suggest. I'm asking. A, uh, sorry, convener. I'm asking for us to seek information from a company who is making millions out of people on their broadband. Why can't these people get access to a cable going through a village? Surely you wouldn't have put that to a vote. Well, I'm, I, I've made a suggestion to the committee, and, and, and you seem to be the one at the moment who's not happy with my suggestion. Can I, can I ask the committee, are you happy with my suggestion that, that we keep the petition open and take this forward with the Cabinet Secretary when he comes in? Mr Finney. You know, I I don't think Mr Lyle's request is unreasonable. It is a bit of technical information. I think it's entirely fair to say, as, as Mr Rumbles has, that you know, I, I know someone where the, the, whose property abuts the, where the line goes to the Faroe Islands. They can't get into it. Um, um, but I think it's not an unreasonable question to ask the technicalities of that location. I think it might inform our decision. Yes, but, but, of but surely we already know this. We've, we've gone over this ground in committee over many months. The reason that we can't, we couldn't get access to the line which runs right in front of our household or whatever it is, is because it's a major cable and it doesn't go. There are no green boxes immediately around it. So the distribution point isn't. The cable runs past somebody's property, but the distribution points don't, and it's as simple as that. I mean, I, I fear the Scottish Government, you know, has, has well, I fear that the case has been laid out, you know, with the Scottish Government's response, and it is quite a detailed response, saying, that, you know, that it was laid as part of the digital uh, Scotland superfast broadband, and the spread out of the community spread out over four kilometres. I mean, we would probably get the same answer from BT that we have, that we would be getting from the Scottish Government. Stuart. Um, I, I just make the technical point that while a fibre cable is a quarter of the price of a copper cable, putting a tap, the technical term, onto that cable is very expensive, much more expensive than putting onto a copper cable. And we know that the, the minimum cost that there's going to be when there's about 50 households is £4,000 per household. The reason it's not being done is because funding is not being provided yet to do it. It's not about anything other than that. We can t certainly ask, if we want to know more about the technology of how you put a tap on and what the constraints are, fair enough, but I don't think it will particularly inform the committee's decision-making, because at the end of the day, it's up to us to make sure the government provides the funding and the programme that gets it done. OK. So, yeah. this, uh, if I continue la labouring this, but at the end of the day, if a cable has been laid, and people are then saying, we can't get access to that. I think that's a bit, you know, we've got to ask why. We've got to ask the cost. Uh, you know, we've got to react. And, uh, you know, we can't wait for a cable again that's coming up, you know, maybe in a year's time or whatever. There's a cable already there. You know, I never take, sorry, Stuart, I never take no for an answer. I want to know why. And I believe that we should be asking why 
we can't, people like Mike Rumbles and other people in Scotland can't get access to something that's passing right by the front door. And sorry, I'm not going to shake my head. I'm going to ask why. Can I, can I suggest, therefore, uh, uh, as, as your convener on this, that we, we move forward with my suggestion of taking it up with the Cabinet Secretary? Oh, at, and Mr Lyle, it is entirely your appropriate to do so. So it, you, you, you can't actually... Well, let's discuss that. Let's discuss that afterwards. Can I suggest that this is a matter we take up with the Cabinet Secretary? And, and, and in, the, in the questioning, when we get to broadband, I mean, I think it would be appropriate that the whole issue of connecting into uh, broadband cables, local broadband cables, and how R100 will be delivered with those cables, which have been laid by other providers, should be raised, and we'll make sure that it is. So is the committee happy that we move forward on that basis? Okay. I therefore would like to move on to agenda item five, which is the European Withdrawal Act. And this is the sift of one EU exit instrument as detailed on the agenda. The Scottish Government has allocated the negative procedure to this SSI. Is the committee agreed that, and, uh, that it is content with the parliamentary procedure allocated to this instrument by the Scottish Government? Yes. J Jamie. If I may, uh, I'm content. I should add for the record, and I have no comment on this specific uh, instrument, but I did have a question for the clerks regarding the process. Um, in the notes, uh, in terms of consideration of the procedure, uh, in comments 9 and 10 in our papers, um, and for the benefit of members, I'm looking at the uh, papers provided by the clerks on this uh, SI, uh, 9 and 10 states that Scottish Ministers have Ministers have discretion about whether instruments made should be subject to the affirmative or negative procedure unless they're in a specific category, in which case it would be a mandatory affirmative. But it then goes on to say that the lead committee, in this case ours, would have the opportunity in advance of its consideration to recommend that the procedure allocated should be changed. So presumably that means we would have the ability to say that we would suggest it would be subject to a positive or negative. What I'm unsure about is when it says in advance of its consideration, if we are considering it at a committee meeting such as today, based on the papers that we've been given the previous week, at which point do we have the ability to consider it and therefore perhaps make a recommendation to change that an instrument be negative or positive? Uh, that's something, if the decision's actually been made during that meeting, if, if the committee... Yeah, the answer is now. <laughs> right, okay. I mean, that, that's why this is agenda item uh, uh, five and... When we move on to the instrument, it's a separate agenda item. So you're right. I see. But, but uh, uh, the clerks, if, if the clerks could just explain that. Yeah, I mean, the convener is right, just what he said. But we do also send instruments out in advance of members do have a concern. We ask that question in the email that we send that out. So you do have that opportunity before it actually reaches a formal committee meeting. But if a, a member did object to the, the procedure being recommended, uh, this would be the time to say that, and we could delay consideration of the next item. So we could, we could uh, review that further. Oh, I see. That's very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I, I think there was a general agreement that, that, uh, that, that we've agreed that the procedure. Is that correct? Agreed. Agreed. OK, so we move on to agenda item six, which is subordinate legislation. Uh, this is the consideration of one negative instrument as detailed on the agenda. I would say to the committee, no motions to annul or representations have been received in relation to this instrument. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? It is agreed. I therefore move on to agenda item seven, which is the European Union Withdrawal Act. We have received consent notifications in relation to five UK SIs as detailed on the agenda. These instruments are being laid in the UK Parliament in relation to the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Could I ask if there are any comments? If there are no comments, does the committee agree uh, to write to the Scottish Government to confirm it is content for a consent for the UK SI referred to on notification to be given? We are agreed. That's good. And that, therefore, concludes uh, today's committee business. And therefore, I would now close the meeting. Thank you.